Hi, my name's Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer for the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. Today my subject is Superconductivity is Infectious. Okay, so I've had an interesting journey since about 2009, uh, which kind of concluded in that I'm going to give you a summary now uh, on the 1st of October 2017. So what am I talking about? Well, it's superconductivity. Okay, now I don't know that much about superconductivity, you know, the basics maybe. Um, however, uh, my journey started one rainy monsoon day in Trivandrum at the Rotary Club, right in the centre of the city. And I was having a, just a talk with someone I was introduced to who worked at the Vikram Space Centre. Uh, that is about 16 kilometres away from the centre of Trivandrum. And I was talking about, you know, how I'd bought a solar panel on my roof and uh, I got some e-bikes and I was travelling to and from work. And I'd always been very passionate about uh, energy and finding better solutions uh, to the energy problem that we all face. Well, uh, he said, uh, well, we've got this incredible device uh, at the Space Centre, which we've uh, invented. Uh, and what it was, as he described it, was a, a ball. And this ball you could put into a fire and it produced electricity. Uh, and I'm thinking, well, is it a uh, thermoelectric generator? I mean, it can't be really because you don't have a cold sink. There's no hot side or cold side. It's just hot all around it. So anyway, um, obviously I was never going to get access to the space center or maybe I could have got access but it didn't occur to me to um, ask for it. Uh, and that was then and then um, I was uh, lucky enough to go to ICCF uh, 17 uh, and uh, help uh, form the MFMP and uh, the journey started, and um, eh, on 18th of April 2014, I had an opportunity to interview Brian Ahern. Now, uh, the interviews and other links will be um, in the Steemit. The link to the Steemit will be in this uh, video. Anyway, so I was talking to Brian Ahern, and this guy was the lead scientist for the US Department of Defense specializing in superconductivity. And he was, during the course of this interview with him, he was talking about this uh, guy, Arthur Manellas, and he had developed this electric car that was uh, powered by this self-regenerating magnet and wire-based device, and uh, he actually has it. I mean, uh, Brian Ahern has it, but unfortunately, it was disassembled uh, just prior to Arthur Manellis having a stroke from which he never survived, uh, ultimately. And so the thing wasn't reassembled. But they did various tests on it, and yes, it did recharge these batteries. And uh, the nub of the story, the interesting part about the story, was that the, um, the, the, the cores in these, uh, the cores of the magnets or whatever they were, they would actually get, or they would be, cooler than the ambient temperature by uh, some degrees. And, and this is um, talked about in my interview with him. Anyway, um, here we have a guy who is, uh, you know, put into this position because of his uh, thesis was done on superconductivity. And uh, he's looking at this process, which is apparently generating electricity and part of the device is getting cold in that process. Anyway, so I'm going to fast forward now to 2016 and uh, Francesco Cellani, who was the wonderful scientist that gave us our first opportunity uh, in uh, forming the MFMP to have something to test, which was his uh, nano-coated copper wire, or actually specifically nano-coated uh, um, constantin wire. Um, this uh, wire uh, uh, seemingly, with our tests, multiple tests, uh, uh, seemingly produced some excess uh, power in the form of heat. 
But last year, uh, Francesco started reporting that he was getting anomalous electric or electrical or electricity production uh, from the wires. And, you know, we debated internally and so forth about whether this was some sort of thermoelectric effect again. But, of course, then the whole wire is hot. But we did know that some parts of the wire were cooler than others, and that was part of the dynamic structure of the system. But, you know, his latest wire is kind of like all encased. And so it kind of, in my mind, made me think, oh, this is... Maybe similar to that kind of device that the uh, guy at the Trivandrum uh, Rotary Club was talking about that came from the Vikram Space Center. Um, but of course, it's just a, a wire <clears throat> in this case. Maybe the principle's the same. I don't know. I didn't think too much about it. Anyway, uh, I had an opportunity to go and speak at IIT Mumbai, uh, and I gave a presentation which was... Uh, uh, inspiring to one of the people there, and that was uh, a guy called Suhas Ralkar, uh, the inventor of the Echo Reactor. Uh, I was given the opportunity to take some of the fuel that he had lying around. In fact, I asked for, if he had anything, and there was something in his uh, office that he found, and a couple of samples of fuel and foil. So I, I took that away with me and tested that. And uh, to my complete surprise in the fuel, which was meant to be starting with um, some nickel, some titanium, some carbon uh, in water with one and a half kilowatts, one and a half kilowatts and one and a half kilowatts of 19.46 uh, kilohertz uh, ultrasonic power. Uh, in this, there was significant quantities of uh, uh, niobium, uh, about three and a half percent or something on various sample areas, uh, and uh, very high concentrations of lead, like 40, 50 percent. Uh, and what's really interesting about these things, when I started looking to why are these, I mean, there was tin there, there was zirconium. Uh, I, I, the interesting thing was, when I was looking into these, what is special about these particular elements? Why would these, let's assume they did form, why, why would they have formed uh, in this particular fuel processor? Okay, so it could be contamination. Uh, and the contamination sources uh, that we looked at were maybe the uh, resonators themselves. Um, it could be that the resonators are shaking the reactor. And one hypothesis I had that, you know, it's not so much contamination, it's that the elements within the um, uh, the reactor uh, become the... Uh, elements that are shaking them. So it's like doing it in sympathy. So the PZT, that's the, uh, I think it's like lead zirconium and, and titanium. I think um, that's what it is. Um, but that doesn't explain the niobium. And the niobium is the highest temperature elemental superconductor. And it's also a type 2 elemental superconductor. So uh, I think it's like... Oh, can't remember offhand. Maybe it's like nine point something Kelvin. And lead is the next uh, highest critical temperature superconducting uh, uh, single element on its own. I think it's seven point something Kelvin. Maybe six point seven. I, I don't know. These things are easy to find um, on Wikipedia or wherever you choose to get your information from. But the point was, it was that the top two elemental superconductors, one type 2, niobium, and one PB, also tin, which was in there. Um, actually, that might be, it might be PZT, it might be tin. Hmm. Anyway, these things are easy to find out, PZT. Um, so I was thinking, it's kind of like, is the material in this processor that was processed with this 4.5 kilowatts of ultrasonic sound for up to 200 hours, um, was it kind of just, it's being shaken, it's being shaken, and is it just becoming the material that is most comfortable with the kind of vibration? Not not, not the 19.46 kilohertz, but some other quanta or frequency of vibration that is, um, you know, it's being exposed to. Uh, so these are kind of some of the ideas that were going around in my head. Uh, of course, 
you know, uh, the simplest would be it's just contamination. But it is odd that you're le- literally getting like 50% lead. You know, that's a lot of contamination. It's like cutting up bits of lead and putting it in there. It's like, ooh, it's contamination. So, um, <clears throat> of course, with, with uh, uh, SEMEDX, you're, you're um, looking at the surface. So uh, one might say that you needed to do another process uh, like mass spectrometry where you, you're looking at the whole uh, amount of the material and doing the, the atomic weight in the whole amount. But actually, physically, the pieces in the SEMs look like they're soft, they're like rounded and flat plates, like they've just been squished. And I can't really imagine nickel and titanium, the two metals that are in there to start with, just just being squished flat into these almost look like ductile discs of, of lead. Um, anyway, so that's that. And, and, and so shortly after, that, that was in uh, March 2017, uh, and, and then in the 9th of June 2017, it was actually early morning, um, I was preparing my presentation uh, for the uh, ASTI CMNS, that's Condensed Matter Nuclear Science uh, um, uh, Conference in ASTI in uh, Italy. And I was sitting there and this person came in. Uh, it was after the, the the grand dinner or whatever. And a lot of people came back drunk. I couldn't drive because I was living away from the hotel and uh, uh, I was driving. So I, I couldn't drink. So I came back early to, to work on my presentation. Anyway, a couple of hours later, the guests came back. And, and then a few other hours later, uh, this particular person came in and they were very, very drunk. And I was working on my presentation. They came over and said, oh, you haven't got anything. You know, you've got no data, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I said, no, I, I think, you know, you can't say these things without actually looking to see what we've got. Uh, and so I, I managed to convince this person to take a look at uh, what we had seen in uh, various data sets uh, from uh, Suhas Ralkar's foil and from his uh, fuel and uh, from... Um, uh, the uh, data from uh, one of the reactors from Alexander Parkhamov and the cross correlations between those and uh, previous experiments conducted by other scientists in the field. And so I talked about this, you know, superconductivity aspect. And, and I said, to me, it looks like one of those videos. And I'll show you this to you in, in, in a little while, uh, just part of it. And then you can go and look at the video in the Steemit. But anyway, when you start off, say, like 36 metronomes on a, a semi-rigid um, uh, uh, platform, and they're all going in different angles, uh, you know, times like this, after a while, they all kind of go into sync. And of course... You know, <clears throat> there's two aspects to that. One is this kind of insight that I had where the elements within the fuel processor were becoming the elements that were trying to excite them. That's kind of one thing like this metronome going into sync. And the other thing is that um, superconductors themselves uh, have this uh, Meissner field or, or they, they, they these Cooper pairs or however it is, you know, those people that understand this more, like Brian Hearn, for instance, um, uh, would know more about that. But um, you can imagine that if if they are superconductors and they can act in sync, then there's there's just less overall resistance in there. And that's the point about resistant, uh, superconductors. There's less resistance. So it's like... It's like they are all becoming the same thing and it's the most uh, easy thing to conduct the power through them and to transfer it or, or, or whatever um, to just make life easy. Uh, and, and anyway, so I was, I was pointing her to this and I was pointing to all the other transmutations and she said, yeah, well, we, we get all these kind of transmutations. We, we see those things. Uh, so when I was talking about that um, and like the idea of breeding superconductivity um, and the fact that it, I hypothesized it was easiest to be in that state uh, and that one thing was affecting the other, this person was very drunk and um, they said, well, I, I probably shouldn't be saying this, but we've discovered in our labs and, you know, this person had said, oh, you know, if you've got something, you know, we can get all the military money and I can I can get money from governments and, you know, we can do experiments and, and, and everything. There was this big bravado about what they could do with real technology and how much uh, resources they could bring to bear. 
uh, and then there was the mocking, and, and then there was me showing the, 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 the data and, and my hypothesis about what might be going on. And then she just said, oh, uh, well, we've seen this thing. And she goes, I should probably not be saying this, but um, we've seen this thing in a lab where if we take a superconductor and we put it at the end of a piece of wire, then after a while, the whole wire becomes like a superconductor. And I'm thinking, whoa, is that the same thing? Uh, I mean like these metronomes coming into sync when they're all out of sync to start with, you know, and then they all come into sync. Is that just what things will do when they're put into this state? Anyway, so um, I'm going to step forward to um, around about uh, July. And I, I was talking about the various observations that I had heard about um, of um, turning... Um, uh, metals into liquids because uh, the w the way um, metal lattices are held together is by electrical uh, the, some pros uh, aspects of ele electrons and and that if you can manipulate the way they work then the uh, observations of turning a, a, a metal to uh, a liquid but without raising its temperature or not raising its temperature to the normal melting point um, sort of like metal softening um, that these things uh, 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 are possible and that multiple people have observed them then someone on uh, one of the forums said have you heard of the work of Thomas Bearden and I thought who's Thomas Bearden anyway they gave this little se segment and I managed to find the segment online he didn't really say much but I thought you know what um this guy's talking about uh, metal softening, and uh, I w went and bought his books. And uh, so I bought his book, uh, uh, Fur de Lance, uh, and it's uh, about the Soviet energetics program. This guy called Tom Bearden, uh, and uh, this other one called Oblivion. Now, in one or other of these books, uh, not only does it say pretty much everything that I predicted you could do with this technology uh, following uh, my presentation in um, uh, uh, India um, uh, that it seemed obvious to me you could do X, Y and Z with this technology if it was real. He actually says not only uh, can you, it's been done, he gives specific cases uh, and uh, just anyway I, I recommend um, as I go through various aspects in the, the next couple of weeks um, that you get hold of these books, read them, um, and revisit my armor or my presentation in India in context uh, to what's said in these books. Anyway, the interesting thing with relating to the uh, uh, metal uh, softening was, uh, one, um, he had sent some uh, English, Russian-speaking scientists, I think in 1990, to Moscow to witness this metal softening and mold, cold uh, forming process. So what they used is some sort of electromagnetic device. Uh, the metal was made into a liquid, but not hot. They would put it into a mold. And then he also went on to say that he took the um, the uh, scientists to London and that there were um, uh, uh, many scientists that observed this and they would pour the stuff into a mold and then they would have to drain out the charge or something, they would have to ground it or, or whatever to finish the, the molding process so that, you know, it would re-solidify. So that was really, really interesting. I recommend you get these books, even if you just want to read that particular segment. Um, however, in the same segment, one the other thing that these um, Soviet scientists showed them in 1990, before it got reclassified, um, uh, was uh, the transfer of huge amounts of energy over very fine wires. Okay, well, you know that silver is the most conductive element on Earth, and it, at a certain diameter of wire, ordinarily it would only be able to carry a certain amount of power. Okay, so um, in that case, uh, what are they doing to allow for a very large amount of power to travel over a, you know, a small wire. Well, you might think that that is some sort of superconductivity, isn't it, right? Well, last week, uh, 
I was uh, told that it, there was an opportunity to go to uh, a conference in Graz uh, uh, by someone that I had uh, given a presentation to, actually the guy that organised the presentation in Copenhagen. And he suggested, oh, well, I'm going to this conference. You know, I didn't know about it. Um, so uh, I, I found out that Francesco Cellani was speaking there and I really wanted to catch up with him, find out how things are going and so on. So I organised and, and, and arranged to go down there and just to see how he was getting on and, you know, if there's anything else of interest at this conference. Well, the there were some interesting things. There were also some not so um, interesting things. Anyway, uh, I was fascinated, actually, because one of the presentations was, was this Australian guy. And the uh, video of that is also in this, uh, the Steam It that uh, will be linked to from this video. And he was talk <clears throat> talking about this Keshi guy, this like um, uh, Iranian guy, uh, came from an extremely rich family, had some sort of insight and uh, came up with this technology. Now, you know, I was extremely skeptical in the past, hadn't really given it much thought. You know, I don't know. Uh, if it works or it doesn't. Uh, however, uh, what he described it as is you get this wire and you put it in a certain form formation. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, Tilani is now passing the wire through the into knots and so on. Anyway, you form these wires and these loops and then you treat them uh, in what he calls GANs, which it's it's some uh, structural form, uh, according to him, uh, of uh, uh, elements or compounds. Uh, anyway, the, the the point is is that um, uh, in Tom Bearden's book, he had talked about this concept of the a negative resistor. Okay, now. Uh, I'm stepping back, actually. So in Tom Bearden's book, he talked about this concept of a negative resistor. Now, a resistor is something where you push, push electricity through it and it produces heat, right? OK, it's pretty easy to understand. So a negative resistor, presumably, uh, would be something that produces electricity by taking heat or some form of other energy out of the environment. Now... That does sound a little bit like Brian Ahern's description of the Manellus device in that the parts of the device, I think it was the, the cores, uh, were colder than the atmosphere and it was generating power. Uh, Chelani's wire, it's warm and it's generating power. The guy from the Vikram Space Center, it's warm and it's generating power. Now... Uh, is it only with heat? I mean, is it something that gets cold and then it's generating power? Or is it actually pulling other energy out of the environment, maybe the so-called vacuum energy? Well, the interesting thing about Keshi's technology, and the, these are the claims, is the uh, Magrav, I think it's the Magrav uh, um, unit, this thing with the coils and this so-called GANS material as the mini stars, um, you are meant to plug them into your home electricity supply and over a period of time, um, the power usage in your house from all of your appliance that are appliances that are connected in your house is meant to go down. And this is an extraordinary claim that I would have thought was absolutely and utterly bonkers absolutely utterly bonkers the idea is that supposedly the nano coated copper mm, sounds a bit like Chelani's wires nano coated copper this nano coated copper wire uh, uh, loop system is able to condition the wires in your house over a period of like 30 to 90 days such that they all kind of superconduct. So that's what it's saying. It's like, and the appliances, the wires within the appliances. And it does seem 
there are a number of people now all the plans for making this are open this is not something that you have to invent the the diagrams there there are even people selling kits for like even just 175 euros you buy a kit it's already made you just got to assemble it you know all the parts are made you just got to assemble it and then you plug it in and supposedly you're going to get these power savings there are people that are claiming 60 percent power savings on their house okay there are people that are home building these things and, and actually showing you exactly how to make the GANS material and how to make the wires and so forth. Now, like I say, I would have thought this is utterly bonkers. Had I not witnessed, had I not witnessed the seeming production of superconductors in super or uh, superconducting elements, elements that are elemental superconductors in uh, Suhas Ralkar's uh, fuel processor and had I not then been told that this big lab whatever it was I don't actually know what lab it is but this person told me they put a superconductor on one end of the wire and after a while the whole wire starts acting like a superconductor this sounds exactly like this Magrav unit so uh, I don't know um I think it's worth investigating. Uh, you know, maybe someone's got some experiences out there. I'll drop a couple of videos in uh, into uh, the Steam It where some people are claiming, you know, they did X, Y, and Z and they built their, their unit. And then other people are saying, you know, my electricity bills are down. And other people are, are saying uh, they're even claiming, like, actually having self-running things. Oh, I have no idea whether it's complete nonsense or not. But... If I had been asked this prior to ASTI, prior to the 9th of June, here's the evidence about how the Keshi technology works. Here's the evidence. Uh, if I'd have been asked, does this work? Uh, I had said, absolutely not. No, it's just complete nonsense. But having gone through this journey, I've heard about these things, which in Tom Bearden's parlance is a negative resistor you know what goes up must come down so you know it's warm uh whatever uh, you know now it's now it's getting colder you know if something's getting colder it's like moving towards superconductivity i don't know and so um and there's a very specific thing i talk about in my asti presentation which I, I will publish which is related to this uh, and on what I think is possibly going on underneath in many many of these systems in Lena and 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 possibly if this Keshi technology works um it's 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 really um it's piqued my interest uh I think it's it's worth having a look at um uh and you know the universe only works in one way uh, uh, and it's got all of these mysteries there for us to discover. Um, and it's being consistent. You know, you have the Vikram Space Center, Brian Ahern, Francesco Cellani, who has Ralkar's fuel. This person who told me that this is what they've observed in their labs, not only the tra other transmutations, but the fact that if they take the superconductor and put it on a wire, the whole thing becomes like that. Tom Bearden discussing about the Soviet energetics that they witnessed in 1990, saying that they could transmit amazing amounts of wire uh, power over these thin wires. And then if you look at some of these YouTubers uh, that have built this Keshi technology, they're saying that they can they physically touch the wires and they, they say large amounts of power going through and the wires are cold. And if you look at the video of the latest version that this Australian company is producing, the wires are really thin. And my first thought when I was looking at that was, they're saying they can put 40 kilowatts over this wire, and that wire is really thin. That's just a joke. Until you step back to what Tom Bearden's saying, and saying they were able to transmit huge amounts of power over uh, thin wires wires now there's another american group where they 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 tag uh, a daisy chain by in, uh, switching the power on each step uh, um, uh, four of these magrav whatever units they are together and 
if they were putting, I think it was inductive loads on there, uh, they were using less and less power. If they put a resistive load on there like a hairdryer, it actually started using power again. So I don't know. Um, I think it's really interesting. So take a look at the video from the Australian guy. You know, as I said, I would have taken it with a pinch of salt uh, had I uh, watched it six months ago. Um, but I can't honestly say I can take it with a pinch of salt now. Uh, and so if you can save 50% of your power, like in your house, uh, that is just huge. Uh, so, you know, m maybe a serious uh, study over a number of months uh, um, needs to be conducted. If people are interested uh, in that happening, uh, then they can specify that, that we do that. Uh, if they want to make a donation uh, and, and specify that that's what that donation is for, uh, that would be great. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's other members of the MFMP that are more than capable of doing that because I've probably got enough to handle uh, at the moment. Uh, and I will be addressing many of the other things that I talked about uh, after my presentation in India that are also talked about in this book in relationship to um, other aspects. And then I will also talk about uh, what uh, is common to what I've just been discussing in this video to the Lion Reactor, which I hope to get out some details, uh, more details on uh, uh, some, the, the, how this was built and the very, very interesting phenomena that was observed with this. And also this is uh, the um, split uh, iron uh, rebar or steel bar that you saw in the Sparks video, uh, the one where there was a, it, it seemed to um, go metal softening, or at least it got hot enough to to be able to be drawn with just the hand drawing, uh, with little resistance at the other end. Um, some very interesting uh, um, uh, experiment that we did with this, which is. Uh, uh, kind of related to this and related to what I've been discussing. So interesting times ahead. Uh, keep tuned. Uh, and uh, maybe superconductivity is infectious. <laughs>